come in. I'll get started. Uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mark Kleinschmidt. Uh, I have the uh, privilege of being the president and the CEO of the Anne Arundel Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're a membership business organization uh, based throughout Anne Arundel County. We've got about 450 members um, currently, and we're growing. Um, we're adding new members. Uh, we are excited to help our members kind of survive and get through uh, the pandemic. It was a rough time for many of us for, for two years, but now we're, as I call it, on the other side, moving into the new normal. Um, and a lot of us have to rethink our business and, and how we keep the customers we have, but how do we you know, find new customers? And one of the things I would suggest that your membership in the Chamber of Commerce is gonna provide you some really important uh, real-time information uh, and also help connect you with your next customer. Um, the other things we are involved in is uh, government affairs, legislative matters. Our, our friends in the General Assembly just wrapped up our, their 90-day session. And there were two or three bills that got passed um, that are going to have an impact on, on your business in terms of uh, a new tax uh, that you all will probably have to be looking at uh, dealing with to pay and administrate and some other uh, real estate related things con concerning um, the, uh, and it's an important bill, the environmental, uh, the gas house, greenhouse gas uh, emissions bill, but that'll have some impacts on our on, um, on businesses. So that's just a little bit about what we're doing um, tonight. If nobody's doing anything um, over at the Annapolis Mall at Rodizio, um, the Brazilian steakhouse. Did I get that right, Amy? It's Brazilian. I got it. I keep getting the country wrong on that one. But uh, we're having a get together networking mixer. Um, so if you are interested and want to meet some new folks or come on out, uh, and just because it might be a nice night to get out, uh, join us over at Rodizio Grill at the Annapolis Mall. Um, but now what I'd like to do is re jump in to talk about the, uh, the employee tax or the employee retention credit that we've got. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to, to Heather, Heather Lawler from our, our board, and she's going to kind of get us started. And then as she gives a little bit of background, what we're going to do is just go around and have everybody introduce themselves. So we have a good idea of who's on the call and, and share a little bit about your business. So Heather, take it away. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. So good morning, everyone. I'm Heather Lawler. I'm honored to serve as treasurer for Anne Arundel Chamber of Commerce. In my professional life, I'm a partner of TMDL CPAs and Consultants, um, which is one of two firms that are represented in today's webinar for the presenters. It's, it's between my accounting firm and then also Frost Law. Um, I'd like to first say thanks so much for joining. We hope you all come away from this hour with some helpful information and new resources. Um, I have put all of our presenters' contact information in the chat box already, so feel free to use those as necessary. Um, without further ado, our first presenter is one of my partners, Norma Tull. Um, after working in the public and private industries for over 35 years, Norma helped found TMDL, CPAs and consultants. Um, she services all our areas of our practice, including CFO, consulting, payroll, HR, audit, and tax, and specializes in government contracting and project accounting and um, focuses a lot on our payroll team. In addition to Norma, uh, we have Rebecca Shepard, who is joining us from Frost Law as an attorney. Um, she has previously worked with the Comptroller of Maryland in the hearings and appeals section and has hands-on experience in multiple tax practice areas from individual income tax, sales and use tax, withholding tax, and, and other areas of that practice as well. And then we also have Peter, Peter who is joining us as well from Frost Law. He concentrates in the areas of tax controversy, planning of business transactions, um, his experience is within tax law, wills and trusts, estate planning, government contracting, and business planning. So we have a really good um, mix of individuals that's going to be um, presenting today. So thanks for your time, and um, we look forward to the next hour and what's in store. Okay, great. Well, before we jump into the presentations, let's just go around and see who is with us and tell us a little bit about your company. I'll call your name out and you can maybe tell us a little bit about uh, your business. Uh, start with uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Smith. Oh, let's see, whoops. We see you talking, Elizabeth, but I don't think we can hear you very well. No. Uh, <laughs> Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, yeah. there you are. So 
I'm with Bay Community Support Services. We are a local nonprofit that provides direct based client care for adults living with intellectual and developmental disabilities within the local community. Um, and we do span into the Southern Maryland region as well. Um, and we're seeing quite a lot of turnover that's happening with our employees. So this hopefully will get some good information from you guys. Good. And how many employees do you have? Um, I would say average about 120, give or take. Okay. All right, it's a good size. All right, uh, thank you. Let's jump over to, is it Jules? Jules Jacobs, if I got that right? Yes, um, Jules Jacobs Kazmarek, um, the bookkeeper at the Anne Arundel County Food Bank. And our mission in Anne Arundel County is to fight hunger by assuring that all families get food. So okay. thank and you how many, for having me. And how many folks do you have out there? You guys do an amazing amount of work uh, out yes. there. Yes, we're a small staff though. We only have 20, 20 um, employees. Small but mighty, you do a great job. Yes, thank you. So uh, how about Marshall? I don't know if I'm saying that right, Marshall? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. I am Marshall Ball and I am um, a State Farm agent. So I own my agency. Um, and I cover Maryland, DC, and Virginia. We insure for auto, home, life, and health. Okay, and how many folks do you have with your, your business? I have um, three, three employees. Okay. So it's small. All right. All right. Small but important. Every employee yeah. certainly counts and adds great value to our community and economy. Uh, let's That's hear from right. Linda Davis now. Linda, a little bit about yourself and your business. Linda, if you're on. all right, let's jump over to who's on the phone with the 202 area code. Who is joining us from on the phone? All right, well, we'll jump Hello? back. Oh, yes, go ahead. Hi, this is Peishi. I'm with One Off Consulting and uh, I do business management consulting services for business all across the industries of uh, various sizes. Uh, we encourage business growth, operational efficiency, and uh, financial well-being. So uh, anyone with businesses who want to um, expand and grow uh, in this um, market field and uh, um, both in domestic and global economy can go ahead and reach out to me. Okay, great. Well, thanks. Thanks for that overview. So, all right, well, tell you what, let's uh, go ahead and jump into the subject matter here. Who's going to lead us off? Is it going to be uh, you, Norma, or, or Paul, or Peter, I think, rather? I think Peter's going to drive. All right, Peter, you are the driver, apparently. So kick us off, please. Sounds good. Well, with my, my first action, I'm going to kick it over to Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> he punted. Uh, thanks so much for having us today. Just to kind of give you guys a little bit of background about me and Peter, which is um, we're tax controversy attorneys. So what that means is that any business or individual that has some sort of dispute with the taxing authority, whether it's the IRS or Maryland or you know DC, um, we can help. So we do audits, we do um, payroll tax liabilities, um, sales tax, you know, all that kind of stuff. And in 2019, in the beginning part of 2020, most of our businesses um, that we helped, small businesses, were kind of on the bubble of viability. We were helping them get through and get compliant and, and pay their taxes. Um, and then obviously the pandemic hit and you know, Peter and I had to really dig into the CARES Act in order to help these people. So we come to this like level of knowledge like pretty organically in order to help our clients, we needed to figure out you know, PPP and then every other little basket of grant and um, tax credit that was available in order to keep our people afloat. Um, and then what happened was we realized we had all this knowledge and not everyone did. And so we've been on this like informational campaign trying to help other small businesses that might be in a better, you know, tax posture, but still could definitely use the help the same way our clients can. Um, so that's why we're here. And Peter's going to kind of go through the legislative history you know, briefly. Yeah. Sure. So just to, to 
I guess, add to what Rebecca said. This is a list on this slide of, of everything that we've worked through, um, primarily through the CARES Act. There was the Paycheck Protection Program. When that first came out, that sucked all the air out of the room. Um, it was the big thing in, in March of 2020. Um, Family First Coronavirus Response Act, you may have heard of FFCRA wages and, and payments. Um, in the CARES Act, there were provisions that allowed for deferral of Social Security taxes um, that needed to be repaid half beginning on December 31st, 2021, half on December 31st, 2022. Then there was this thing, you know, called the employee retention credit. But for the most part, nobody was paying attention to it because you couldn't do PPP and ERC, and frankly, PPP was way more valuable, and we'll get into why that was. Um, other programs that were out there that, that Rebecca and I worked on with clients were the Shutter, Shuttered Venue Operators Grant um, and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, the IDLE program. Um, and so this is, you know, when the world stopped, this is what we jumped into um, and, and worked through these things with our clients. You know, this is really just a list of all the legislation um, that has been enacted that is related to the employee retention credit. The CARES Act first introduced it, but again, nobody was paying attention to it. It wasn't lucrative back then, um, and you couldn't get both. But late in, you know, the, the Trump administration, December 27th, 2020, Congress said, just kidding, you actually can get it. And you can also get it not just for 2020, but also 2021 in quarters one and, and two. And we'll get into some of the details there. The new administration comes in, new Congress comes in March 11th, 2021. And they said, hey, you can actually get it for quarters three and quarters four of 2021 as well. Um, and then just to make sure they were keeping us all on their toes, this infrastructure act was passed in November of 2021. And they said, just kidding. Uh, you can't do it for Q4. Um, but all that said, stay tuned, because there is a bill working through Congress now that may add Q4 back. Um, so this has been ever evolving. It's changing. Stay tuned. Um, we're, we're on a wild ride through all this, guys. Um, these are just some of the notices that have come out. They've been much more concise with, with this than, than it was with PPP. PPP came out. I don't know, 50 different notices and 80 something FAQs. Like and the Friday before a holiday weekend, Peter and I would have like a presentation that Tuesday and like at 8 p.m. they'd be like drop new guidance, like perfect. Yeah. Awesome. And they would drop it in a way that you couldn't actually tell what was new and what was old. You had to actually like dig through all of it all over again each time. Really great summer. Totally. So yeah. these are... Um, this is what forms the basis of this presentation. This is where we're pulling these details from. Yes, it's coming from the legislation, the CARES Act and, and the subsequent legisl legislation that amended it. Um, but these are the notices that really flush out the details. And then just um, before we jump into some of the, the details here, um, peril tax basics. So PPP was built on an existing program through SBA called the 7A program. If you got PPP, you worked through the banks. The banks did the application. They served as the front line as far as the forgiveness application went. And you really never dealt with the government. The employer retention credit is different. It's built um, on top of existing internal revenue code and existing forms. And we'll get into the details there, but just payroll basics and, and for those of you with, with employees, you know this, but you're filing 941s quarterly and you're self-assessing um, tax on the business based on both the wages paid to the employee and then an employer's portion of it. So payroll taxes are split between the employee and the employer. Employers withhold income tax and FICA, which is the Federal Insurance Contributions Act, which is Social Security and Medicare. Um, and they pay those over to the government. That's, that's the purpose of the 941. Um, through this process, and, and we'll get into it, but the 941 has been amended seven, eight times, I, I'm not sure, over the last 18 months to accommodate for all these changes. And it's been a real, a real beast. Um, but that's sort of 
basics of you file quarterly returns and the employee retention credit is using those existing forms to um, allow you to claim it. What is it? What are we talking about? So um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with PPP. That had a max credit of $20,000, $20,083 per employee. Um, which is why that's where everyone's gaze focused when the CARES Act was dropped. The employee retention credit was 50% of up to $10,000 in wages per employee um, for 2020. So the max you could get was five grand. So everyone, no, no one paid attention unless you were ineligible for PPP. Not that five grand for the years is bad, but obviously 20,000 is better. And if you couldn't use the two programs together, then, then why bother? Um, when all of this was kind of going through, you know, obviously it's the first time we've kind of worked through a pandemic or in quite some time. And Congress really thought, or at least in my opinion, thought that they were going to turn the economy off like a light switch. Everyone was going to shut down for eight weeks. Corona was going to go away, turn the, the switch back on. Everyone was going to be good. And if you remember in the beginning with PPP, it was like, you're getting two and a half months of wages. You've got eight weeks to use it. We're ticky tacking away, trying to eke out an extra couple of weeks of being able to use all the funds to make sure it was all forgiven. And then as we progressed through the pandemic and we realized, or Congress realized, that this was not going to be eight weeks, that employers needed more help. They changed the eight weeks to 24 weeks. They increased who is eligible for certain things. And then, like Peter said, in December of 2020, they Congress was like, okay we're still in this, you can use these programs together and we're actually gonna expand the credit for 2021. So in 2020, it's $5,000 max per employee. In 2021, it's 70% of up to $10,000 in wages per employee per quarter. That's huge and it changed the game and it made Peter and I you know, refocus, double down on, on all of this so that way we'd be able to help people because now you're talking you know, $26,000 per employee rather than 20. And also you can use the programs together. So we can, we can get a basket here, we can get a basket here, we can get a basket here. And we can make sure that we're making, you know, getting people as much money as they can to kind of like, you know, weather the storm of, um, of Corona and, and how that impacted businesses. Now, well, I think the next slide talks. So just real quick, so that, I think this is where we, we sometimes start to lose people because we start talking about wages and in the, in the slide before I'm talking about taxes. And yeah. so again, this is using existing internal revenue code. So it is a credit for taxes paid, a refundable credit, but it's based on how much you're paying in wages. So it's rewarding you for paying wages and then giving you a credit on your taxes, but it's a refundable credit so it can go past zero and, and we'll get into it, but it, it means actual money back to the company. You're, you're going to get more money back than what you put in, that, that most likely. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on how much money people earn or, and that kind of thing. But most of what we have seen is that if you've paid $50,000 in tax, your, your refundable credit for that quarter, if you're eligible, is going to be $70,000, $80,000. You're going to get more money back than you had, um, which is confusing for folks, which is like fully understandable um, because it's saying it's a tax credit, like how is it more than the tax that you paid? And really, like Peter said, it's just a mechanism for the way the government wants to reward you for having employees, which is a way for them to do it. Um, they took the IRS, which is already like getting killed as far as attrition and things like that. And they're like, we're going to give you this really large program that everyone's going to want to do. And we're going to want you to process it all by hand. Um, and go. So that's that's kind of what happened. Does anyone have any questions so far? I know for us, we get excited talking about taxes and credits, but it may not be for everyone. So if you've got questions now, we can stop and kind of take a beat before we go to the next stuff. I can't tell. I don't see anything. You see anything? Okay. All right, we'll go to the next one. Okay, so who's eligible for the $26,000? An eligible employer means an employer who's carrying on a trade or business during the calendar quarter for which the credit is determined. And, 
Um, so you have to be in business during the time. You can be closed now. If you were in business at the time, then it, it would work. Um, and you either are gonna qualify based on gross receipts or you're gonna qualify based on either restriction or partial restriction. Gross receipts is, is the easiest one. If you can qualify in gross receipts, stop there. That's, that's what you should check first. So for 2020, in, in line with everything else, it was harder to get than it is for 2021. So in 2020, you need a 50% drop in gross receipts quarter over quarter. So second quarter of 2020, your top line, not your income, not your profit, not any of that, your top line gross receipt had to have gone down 50% or more comparatively to 2019 in order to qualify. For 2021, when they went back and expanded the credit and made it easier to get and more money, they also said, okay, instead of 50%, all you need is a 20% drop. Now, these, this test is nothing to do with COVID. You don't need to prove that your drop in gross receipts is tied to COVID. It just needs to have dropped. You can have lost a, a contract. You can have lost a client that was very big. Your fundraiser move from quarter two to quarter three randomly. It doesn't necessarily have to go back to the coronavirus or a government order or anything like that. It's just a baseline. Did your money go down? And if so, you're going to be eligible. Um, there are alternative reference periods for 2021 that allow for automatic qualification for successive quarters. That means that in Q1, if you went down 20%, and in Q2, you went up 90% you're still going to qualify for Q2 because of that Q1 drop. A lot of what Peter and I are seeing, by the way, is that people are saying, well, I made more money. I can't qualify for the employee retention credit. And I'm sure Norma's seeing this as well. And that's not the case. So we'll get into that next. So the gross receipts test, your money went down. The next test is um, full or partial suspension. So this is a little more ticky tacky. It's more involved, more work is involved. This is when you know, we would say it's best to hire a professional, whether that's a CPA or a lawyer, or whoever, but somebody to actually like dig in and make sure that you qualify and, and that all your ducks are in a row. So um, if you're fully shut down, you're gonna qualify, but you'd probably qualify for that under gross receipts also. Um, the, the main thing that we're seeing is the partial suspension that we can get people to qualify that may be thinking that they weren't already eligible. So your operation of the trader business is fully or partially suspended during the calendar quarter due to orders from an appropriate governmental authority limiting commerce, travel, group meetings, yada, 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 due to the coronavirus disease. So this is different than gross receipts. It has to be tied back to a government order and it has to be tied to the coronavirus. Now, what does that mean? What's a partial suspension? How much does your business have to be suspended? A lot of people automatically think about restaurants. That's an, that's an easy one, right? They're allowed to have takeout. They weren't allowed to have their dining rooms open. As long as their dining room sales represented more than a nominal portion of their sales in 2019, then they're gonna qualify for those quarters. Now, what's nominal? The IRS has said nominal is 10%. So if you're over 10%, then you're gonna qualify. Um, so restaurants is something that's like a very simple thought, a very like easy test to meet, but there are a lot of other businesses as well that are going to meet that partial suspension test that you may not think about readily, like a law firm who is, um, solely litigation, like a plaintiff's injuries firm. The courts were closed and they weren't able to go to their de facto workplace, which is the courthouse. Um, they weren't able to file lawsuits. They weren't able to go to jury trials. Insurance companies weren't talking to them because they were, you know, not able to um, to file suit and to actually like threaten the things to, to move a settlement along. Those are going to qualify too. And there's a lot of other businesses we're seeing, um, like chiropractors, dentists, doctors, um, a lot of nonprofits that we've seen. They're not able to host their events that they typically do, whether that's trainings, whether that's in-person, you know, galas and fundraisers and, and that kind of thing. Um, they're, we're not saying you're automatically going to be qualified, but it's certainly something to take a look at. Can you think of any other businesses, Peter? Well, just um, our, our State Farm agent who's on here, to the extent you had to close your, um, your, your retail to the extent you got foot traffic coming in and, and 
sitting down and, and you were bringing in business that way as well. Um, you know, those are issues. And just, just to clarify here then, yeah. and you, Rebecca mentioned it, but just to drive the point home, it's, it's the 10% analysis is what was going on in 2020. So your, excuse me, 2019, your receipts could have gone up during the pandemic. Yeah. And, and that is okay in, in the partial suspension. So it's a two, two-step two test. Was there a government order that restricted you? And was it affecting more than a nominal portion 2019? Absolutely. I have restaurants that had a large tax liability, like $200,000. Their takeout business went gangbusters during all of this. Their receipts went up and they qualified their credits paid for all their tax liability and they also got checks. It was, it was amazing. Um, Norm, are you seeing that similar type of thing with, with you all? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, it's more so, um, it was marginal though. I mean, we saw, we, they have re repurposed themselves. Um, yeah. the food trucks out there um, in lieu of having, you know, um, dining, dining customers. So uh, they found other ways, alternate ways of uh, generating revenue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just because your receipts went up or your fundraising went up or however, you know, you, you look at receipts, um, that doesn't mean that you're out of the picture. So definitely something to still think about. And the, the notices that, that I referenced in the beginning they're jam packed full of examples and like there's one certainly they talk about the restaurants and, and indoor dining but they talk about a retail store that had to close its storefront but had a great e-commerce situation and went gangbusters selling on the internet but there was a taking and i don't i don't think rebecca said it yet but we think about this like eminent domain the government wants to build a road through your property they have to compensate you for it in this situation the government took something from you. They prevented you from working in, in some place, some way. They restricted you. And you're being compensated for it because you nevertheless kept people employed. And that's really, I think, the public policy behind here that, that they're trying to flush out in this prong of the employee retention credit. Any questions? Because this is this is really the, you know, the, the grocery yeah. test is where, you, is where you start. The grocery so Peter, test is... Peter, I'm going to ask a question on behalf of everyone here. So can you further clarify the gross receipts within this method too? Um, there is no decline. Is that what I heard you say? You don't have to prove the decline in total, just in that area of business in which that was, was impacted, I guess is what I'm yeah. trying to... It's not, it's not a perfect science here. Um, the notices discuss a portion of business operation. So you're going to have to define what that means. It's not clearly set out. Um, for a restaurant, it may be easier to say, well, sales that came from a dining room or in a retail situation, it's sales that came from, you know, your, your sales floor. Um, some of you may have more challenging um, definitional stuff. And that's, that's something that we're happy to work through, but the idea really is that you go back to 2019 and you look at what you had going on in that segment of your business. And if that was more than nominal, meaning not less than 10%, um, that constitutes something that would qualify you for that partial suspension. So these are, these are essential employers who weren't completely shut down, but they still had some sort of a taking a restriction on their business operations. And that's what qualifies you under this, under this analysis. But so this is, this is where. Quick, sorry, it's not just 10% of revenue though from 2019, it's also hours. So, you know, for nonprofits and people going out there, I know we've helped people before where they're doing like they used to do trainings once a month and they used to do all these other things and they're not able to do any aspect of that because the people there are training are like in jails and they're not able to do a virtual response. So like if the accommodation isn't adequate, um, obviously for us, we can still do Zooms. <laughs> um, we appreciate you all coming today. But for a lot of other organizations, it's not the same and you're not able to reach the same amount of people 
And so these are all the things to think about. Um, it's some, something I, I, somebody was saying they were from uh, Bay Community Nonprofit. Um, I mean, to the extent you're doing, you know, Zoom therapy or something like that, there, there's, an, there's a Q&A in there, an example of a, of a physical therapist who um, could switch over to Zoom, but they weren't really able to access all of the tools. So they were able to somewhat service their clients, but it wasn't the same. And so working through analyses like that is, is really a lot of the stuff that we've been doing these days is, is working through those types of issues to say, well, is this, is this something that would qualify? Is the government order really taking some, something from you? Right. And this is, I usually give this example and I didn't this time. So I, I'll, I'll hop in with it, but um, you know, think of like eminent domain, the government comes in and they, you know, build a road on your backyard. You're able to, come in and, you know, you should be compensated for that road being on your backyard. Um, the government is coming in and limiting the way you're able to operate. The way you were able to operate before is no longer happening because the government is public health threat is higher. And they're saying, okay, we're not letting you do this anymore. Therefore, you're able to get compensated. So if you think about it that way, is the government's taking something away from you, even if you pivot and did well, that doesn't mean that you still weren't injured or harmed. All right, so a couple other issues, um, and we'll leave some time for, for Q&A um, at the end, but there is a third um, way to qualify for this. This is one of those ideas that came out in subsequent legislation. It wasn't initially part of it, but there, there's something called a recovery startup business. This is basically rewarding someone for starting during the pandemic and then not only starting during the pandemic, but sticking around until Q3 and Q4 of 2021. So by definition, a recovery startup business began operations after February 15th, 2020. Um, additionally, you have to have gross receipts less than $1 million annually. They want you to first try to qualify under methods one or two. If you don't, then you still have the option of being a recovery startup business. The credit itself is only available for Q3 and Q4 of 2021. If you qualify as a recovery startup business, you're, you're capped at $50,000 per quarter. So if you're a recovery startup business, you could get up to $100,000 if that's how you're qualifying. One point here that we've referenced, but just want to drive it home is, again, this is built on existing re internal revenue code. 941s are filed quarterly. You could qualify under a partial suspension for one quarter. You could qualify as a recovery startup business for another. Um, it's, a, it's a quarter over quarter analysis. Um, and we've certainly qualified people under multiple theories before. So that if you've got something unique like that going on and, and want to talk it through, you know, we're happy to do that. So these next couple slides are just, you know, a little bit of, well, what's the catch? Um, because it all sounds too good to be true, right? So what we've worked through now is what qualifies you as an eligible employer, but that doesn't, you know, you're not necessarily working on what are, what's the actual amount of the credit at this point. So one of the interesting distinctions that they made um, is that there are full-time employee considerations um, with this stuff. So in 2020, the important number is if you averaged more than 100 full-time employees in 2021, the important number is 500, more than 500 full-time employees. So if you are over those thresholds, what does it mean for you? And I think somebody said, uh, I think that community said you had 120. What it means is that if you are over those thresholds, qualified wages only include those wages that were paid to people not to work. Okay. They've made it easier from 2020 to 2021. But um, the important point is that a qualified wage, qualified wage that adds up to that $10,000, again, has to be paid to employees not providing services. Now, 
it gets a little bit more nuanced than that because you could be paying wages to someone both to work and not to work. So you could pay someone 15 hours to come to work because that's all the work that you had to give them. But because you wanted to keep your folks employed, you paid them an additional 35 hours of them not to work. Those 35 hours, if you are above these full-time counts, still count as qualified wages and you could still be eligible for the employee retention credit. Um, Peter, we have a question in the chat. Um, somebody's wanting to clarify. So employee bonuses, question mark? Um, there are rules about um, reference periods as far as wages and not being able to sort of jack them up in order to increase your credit. I'd have, be happy to take the question later this afternoon and, and work through some of that. But there, there are some rules there. It's not one that I've had to get into because a lot of these, these things all happen sort of retroactively after the wages had already been paid. So you can't sort of go back and then add a, add a bonus and say that you've already paid it. But generally speaking, there are, well, there are rules in the notices about um, amounts and what can be considered um, qualified wages. So that's something I'm happy to work through offline. It's not something I've had to do so far because the legislation has already passed these periods when, when they start to work through them. So um, there is this, this, well, so the third bullet point here, um, I just wanna make sure certain healthcare expenses. So basically pre-tax premiums that the employers have paid on behalf of employees um, can also be added to wages. One other one that is big for restaurants is that tips that the employer never came out of pocket on can still be used um, as a qualified wage. So restaurants are just like killing it here <laughs> because they, they almost automatically qualify based on a, a, a the closed, you know, the closed dining room. But then on top of that, they get to claim tips that they never even had to pay. So um, this fourth point, you know, I'll just point out that there is some disagreement between the IRS and the Joint Committee on Taxation um, about how to do the full-time employee count. Um, Joint Committee on Taxation is part of Congress. Um, they put out a document explaining the, the CARES Act from their perspective the CARES Act uses um, Affordable Care Act language um, to reference full-time employees. There's language in the Affordable Care Act as far as employee full-time equivalents go. The IRS has said that you do not need to take into account full-time equivalents. Um, and the Joint Committee on Taxation says you do. The IRS has doubled down. They, they've come out in their first notice and then they came out in a subsequent notice and they said, you don't have to take it into account. So I, I think there's definitely um, enough out there that you can proceed just on your full-time count, 30 hours a week or 130 hours a month is what is considered full-time. Um, this next slide just reiterates it's, it's 500 full-time employees during 2021, um, but all the other same rules apply as, as for 2020. So if you are over by the 120 and people didn't get paid to, to not work, then 2021, there were still restrictions we can work through, but you know, you've got a lot more room to, to get to that 500 mark. Sorry, is this me? Yeah. Always. Um, okay. Wages taken into account, the amount of qualified wages credited by the eligible employer for any calendar quarter shall not exceed $10,000. Um, like Peter said about the recovery startup businesses, 50K is the cap per quarter. So if you can qualify a different way, that's better um, because you're gonna not be capped. Uh, refunds of excess credit. This is where everyone should be paying like as much attention as possible. We haven't said anything as important as what I'm about to say. This is not a carry forward credit. This is not a weird NOL that you don't have to pay income tax on next year. This is, this is a check that you're going to receive. It may take a little while. 
you're actually going to get all of this money back from the government. Um, for some reason, this is like the hardest thing for me to convince people of. They're like, well, but I'm not going to actually get money. I'm like, no, no, no. Like you're going to get like a check with your name on it, like the business name from the government for each quarter, you're going to get a check as the returns process. Um, it can really, really help businesses that have been struggling, you know, through this mess. Um, Peter will get into like the catches in a little bit, but for now, you're getting a check. Um, okay, so this is kind of one of the catches too. So once they said you could use ERC and PPP together, people were like, well, how does that, what does that work? How does that work exactly? And what we've done at our firm, and I'm sure that's what um, Heather and Norma do at their firm as well, is, you know, we create a work paper, um, you know, for John Smith or Peter, Huck Peter Huckabow and say, okay, so Peter made $50,000 in 2020. I can take $20,000 and stick it into a PPP column, and I can take $10,000 and stick it in an ERC column, and I can stick $5,000 in FFCRA. And as long as I have enough money for each quarter and it goes to the right spot, I'm good. So you can use all the programs together. You just can't double dip and take the same dollar twice. So if Peter only made $10,000 in 2020 and it was all in fourth quarter um, or third quarter or whatever, you'd have to figure out, like, does it make more sense to go PPP or to go ERC? Now, PPP is tax-free and there's other things, like not sure how people apply for forgiveness, but that's what they mean is you can use these programs all together. You just can't, you know, double claim, basically. Um, oh, how do you get it? Um, sorry, I can't see the top. That's where my uh, little thing is. Um, how do you get it? It's on the 941. I say this a lot. I had a nanny and I had to do my own payroll taxes back in 2014 and I hated it. And um, I don't like the 941s any better now. And the new forms are awful. They're like five pages. There's all these different worksheets and everything else. But that's where you're getting this. That's what Peter's been saying. You know, this is the mechanism for which the government's able to give you this money. You have to file a 941X or past the eligibility periods. There are no new eligibility periods. Therefore, as long as you filed your payroll tax returns on time, which most of you should have, um, the mechanism to get it is to amend your 941, claim the credits, and file with the government. This is the worksheet that you're going to need to fill out and keep with that PPP work paper. And one other thing I'll say, you know, Peter's going to get into like audits and all that, but like, it's very important for you to keep all this paperwork together. Um, people are going to start asking questions about these and you want to make sure you have all your ducks in a row for when you do. If you qualify based on partial restriction or, you know, full, full suspension or anything like that. I mean, we're doing like opinion letters. I'm sure um, Norm and Heather are doing something similar where, you know, we actually take your facts, we take the government orders that apply, we do an analysis of those facts, and we give you that letter to put with your file. So you're going to have your work paper, your worksheets, and your opinion letter. So if somebody comes by and say, like, why did you think that you were eligible for these credits? You have a reasonable basis for why you believe you were eligible. And you can show the government and should make everything like much more painless. And this is where he's so Rebecca, I heard you say about timely filing. So does it all that disqualify of a client where we think they might be eligible, but uh, maybe we didn't do their payroll? Would they automatically be ineligible because they did not timely file and or pay their taxes for the quarter? No, not at all. I just assume that most, uh, unless you're like one of my actual clients, I assume most people pay their, file their returns on time. Um, but you could file it now as a 941. Um, I'm guessing you could electronically file if it was on time, if you hadn't filed yet, right? Well, and, and just remember, there was even times while this program was going on where you could you could proactively uh, reduce your deposits because you anticipated being eligible for this, or even second to last point on this form, 7200 was a request for an advance. So no, uh, your client's fine. Yeah, that would be absolutely fine. Um, and if it's possible for them to electronically file, they might actually get their money in the next 30 days versus how long it takes for a 941X. I just presume that most people have. 
Right. So this slide substantiating um, substantiation for the credit. Um, so with PPP, you know, it, it was processed through the banks. And, and when we were going through that, everybody was asking like, oh, you know, I, I'm nervous. What, what's the bank going to ask for? What do I need to start? You know, I want to get forgiveness right away. I don't want to mess around owing money to the government. Tell me what I need to put in my file. And, you know, Rebecca and I would get on the phone with, with clients and we would say, you know, if this was my business, this is what I would get. If I was the bank, this is what I would be asking for. But we were just guessing. Um, the CARES Act here actually told the government to tell us what we needed. So, um, look, audits are going to happen um, with this. This is a, a ton of money that is being paid to employers for this. If you qualified based on a full or partial shutdown, you need to go and find the order and, and put it in your file. And a lot of these are statewide, but if, you know, I, I've certainly been down in the weeds in the Anne Arundel County um, orders because sometimes they went longer than, than what Governor Hogan did or what um, some of the courts did. If you're in PG County or Montgomery County or Baltimore City, you got to go beyond what the state was doing and go through and find those municipal records. But you got to find it. Um, and we didn't get into it too much, but government orders are that. They need to come from the government. And beyond that, they need to be more than just a suggestion. They need to be more than a statement at a press conference. You need to go through and you need to actually find them. Um, and that's something we've been helping clients do because sometimes it's really hard to find all that stuff. And boy, I mean, if you're in Florida, <laughs> you know, we, we, we see stuff where the governor is making suggestions, but then we're down deep into what did Jacksonville do, you know, vis-a-vis -vis schools. So, it, you know, these things can be tough, um, but you've got to go and find it. You want to keep it in your file. Um, additionally, if you're qualifying based on a decline in gross revenue, you need to have your accounting files and need to be able to show what was going on in 2019 versus what was going on in 2020 or 2021, depending on what quarter you're trying to qualify yourself for. Um, third, you need to actually keep records of your qualified wages and how you did that computation. So in this place to the next point, if you are a large employer and have to be paying wages for someone not to provide services, you need to be able to show that that's what was being done. And if there are some wages that were being paid to provide services and some that were being paid not to provide services, you've got a heavier lift. Um, to the extent you are including health plan expenses, you need to be able to substantiate those. Um, we'll get into some of the other issues, but if you have to aggregate and you are a group employer, you need to you know, have information about ownership and, and how you're aggregated and, and exactly how that all works. Um, we talked about 7,200. 7,200 was in advance, so you could actually try to get cash quicker. I don't know if that actually ever worked for anybody. Um, yeah, it was a nice idea, but didn't, didn't really go anywhere. Um, and then keep copies of your employment tax return and keep these things for I think they say four years in the notice, but keep them for five years and, and we'll get into why. Um, so here, here's the big stuff. So the catch, special issues. Um, I've said it several times now, this is built on internal revenue code that already exists. There are code sections and a bunch of law built around the idea that, you know, common ownership requires aggregation and so if you have a parent child subsidiary situation or brother sister um, ownership overlap um, you need to slow down and you need to work through those issues um, sometimes aggregation can be a good thing it's not always a bad thing and you know that's something that we're working through now where you could have someone who owns a restaurant but also owns and I don't know, an insurance company. And the restaurant gets you qualified and you're treated as a common employer for all of it. And the restaurant gets you qualified based on a partial shutdown, even though it crushed it because of Grubhub and DoorDash. But because you're treated as a common employer, 
and have to aggregate, you're now grabbing employees at your insurance company. Um, and so it can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing because it also imputes all those other employee counts. So to the extent that pops you over for a full-time count, it could be a bad thing as well. Um, but you're also, you know, if you aggregate, you're grabbing gross receipts from all the companies if you're doing a gross receipts analysis. Um, so there's just, there's a lot there if, if you have to do that kind of stuff. Um, second point here is that owners who are 50% 50 50 or more or deemed owners, and a deemed owner is based on a family relationship, um, typical one, brother, sister, grandma, grandpa, parent, kid. Um, those wages are not considered qualified wages. So if you have family working in the business, if you own more than 50% um, of the business, your wages aren't going to be considered qualified for the credit. You can still claim your employees' wages and non-related people. So it's not, it's not a cliff, um, but you're, you're going to have less that you can claim. Um, if you acquired a business, during the pandemic, there are special rules and special safe harbors about how you need to do that analysis with certainly the grocery receipts test. And then there are questions I think out there about how you would treat acquired businesses in a, um, a full or partial suspension. And that's something I'd be happy to work through. Um, sole proprietor income is not eligible. So this is very different from PPP. So if you file on schedule C, for PPP, everybody was asking you, what was your line 31 net business income? Um, that is not going to count for the purposes of the employer retention credit. That said, you can still be a sole proprietor and still have employees. And so it's not a total bar, but you're not going to get credit for those owner wages, which really is fine um, because you're talking about bullet point two here, 50% plus owners not counting their wages either. So it, it, it's to a large degree, um, you know, consistent. Um, Rebecca mentioned nannies. Household employers are not eligible. Um, bright line rule. Even though you're still paying them, you're still filing 941s. They just said, nope, not doing it. Um, interestingly here, the second to last point, the assessment statute in, in normal times or for most of the time when Rebecca and I are working with tax clients is three years from the time the return was due or the date it was filed. In this situation, they have expanded the assessment statute to five years. We'll get into it, um, but you know this is still worth doing because it's such a tremendous financial benefit. But keep in mind that audits are coming. <laughs> it's gonna happen. Um, interestingly, this last point, refund claim statute is not extended. So, We've got an assessment statute for what the government can do, and then we've got a refund statute for, you know, how long you guys have to actually claim this credit. And that has not changed. So you have three years from the due date of the individual 941. So for Q2 of 2020, which is the first year that you would be claiming ERC, the first quarter you would be claiming ERC, um, that refund claim statute expires on July 31st, 2023. So you have over a year to, to make this first claim and then they sort of roll off after that for the next year and a half. This is the biggest catch of all. Um, and again, existing Internal Revenue Code, section 280C. And 280C basically says that if you get a credit based on wages paid, you don't also get to claim the wages paid as a deduction against your income. Seems pretty straightforward, seems fair, but the catch here is that hopefully you all have filed your 2020 tax return and you may have already filed your 2021 tax return. You haven't. So really have. Yeah, if you haven't, consider getting an extension before you before you um, work through the ERC analysis, because what you need to do is go back and amend your 2020 tax returns. And if you filed 2021, those as well, 
and you've got to back out the qualified wages, not all the wages, just the qualified wages. So up to the $10,000 um, that's forming the basis of, of this credit. And if you're a partnership, if you're an S corp, um, that means not only amending the partnership or the S corp return 1065 or 1120 S, but that's going to generate an amended schedule K one, which is going to affect the partners or the shareholders individual income tax return there 1040. And that's going to mean more tax. You're going to have to pay tax on the wages that you're backing out. It still makes sense to do this credit. We are seeing six figure, seven figure refunds that are coming out of this stuff. Is everybody yeah. getting that? Absolutely not. But in the right yeah. scenarios, you know, it is a substantial financial benefit, even though you're going to have to go back and pay individual income tax um, on these on these claims. Yeah, I agree. People, I mean, like I said, I'm sorry, Heather and Norma, I see the same thing where like our clients would be like, oh, $1.3 million. Is it even worth it? And we're like, yes. Yeah. So have you thought about, um, have you, I, we have a few nonprofits on the call, um, what, what impact they, it may have on their financial statements if they're required to have audited statements, um, as well as the potential of, you know, their 990s. Um, do you have encountered any of those as far as revisions related to these kind of post, these claims post financial, you know, uh, pub, pub, you know, pub I have my uh, published statements and uh, filed tax returns. Do you have any thought to that? We haven't gone through that piece of it yet. Um, the nonprofits that we've engaged, I don't, I don't know if we've filed the returns yet. You're um, concerned about the 990s being public and somebody uh, scrutinizing yeah, it? Well, I think the 990s as well as their financial statements, because some of the some of our um, Nonprofits are subject to audit. So um, depending on, you know, we got to 23, man, we'll have to go back and, you know, restate. I mean, I'm just questioning um, some of the, just thinking out loud. I hadn't really thought so much about that until you brought up the point um, for how long this thing we have until we can file these claims. So those 990s are going to be done. They're going to be filed. The financial statements are going to be done and filed. I guess we can do a prior period restatement or prior period adjustment in our financials, um, but just thinking about the tax returns, I mean, I would think they have to be revised. Agree, Heather? Yeah, that'd be yeah. yeah, I would think that we would need to amend those for sure. I think that is the end of the content. Um, but we're certainly happy to stick around and answer any questions. Yeah. And we're happy to do that offline too. I'm sure Heather and Norma are as well. Um, you know, these things are complicated and you can think about it a million different ways. So we know that, you know, we not everyone has spent like a two year going through all this stuff. We're happy to have these calls. So, so the only me. thing that I might want to add um, to the uh, participants um, is that this is a 941X. There is no electronic filing available for 941X, unfortunately. And so as a result, these are gonna be mailed in, um, for, you know, revision, you know, correction, corrections to the 941s. The IRS is extremely backed up. Um, we are seeing, you know, very long delays for them to even open the mail. So the expectation for these this money coming to you, just be realistic that it may be three, six months, maybe nine before you'll actually see a response. Probably more like nine. Yeah, it's taking yeah. a long time. So it's, and it's very important that if you do engage someone to do the 941X, that it's done correctly because that will further delay it. Um, so they'll, they'll kick back if it's not completed properly. So just take caution um, that it's done properly and um, just be patient. Um, they are returning the money. I mean, they really are as um, Rebecca and Peter have indicated they are writing a check and you will get your check um but just understand it's not going to be in 30 to 60 days so it's yeah it's not ppp where you're getting paid like within two weeks or something of, of filing your application 
let me um, a- ask a question. Um, first of all, you guys did a, a great job explaining something that is rather complicated and has a lot of moving parts to it. Um, but as you look at the, uh, the ERC analysis and, and if a company is thinking about it, what's the next step to do it and how long would it take to kind of go through this to, for them to sit down and get us figure out whether they could qualify? So I, I guess step one, I think, is always doing the gross receipts test first. And that is because it's the most objective. If somebody comes and audits you and says, uh, you know, I'm not sure you're an eligible employer, um, you you want to start there because you're going to be able to run a report from, you know, Q3 2019 and take a look at Q3 2021. And if it's a 20% reduction, boom, you're a qualified employer. So it's really doing that analysis first. Um, so if your books and records are in order, you've got some sort of accounting software set up. I mean, that, that really is the first analysis. And, and you could go in and you could say, well, great, I qualify for, you know, I had that 50% drop in Q2 of 2020 and I ate up that $10,000 pretty quick. And so now I've already maxed out my 2020 to the tune of five thousand dollars per employee and then you're looking at the next count you know q1 2021 do the gross receipts test first um second then get into the analysis of well i remember that i had to do one in one out of my retail shop i couldn't let anybody in or uh, i know that i could only have one person per 100 square feet and I have to have two employees that are staffing. And so I could only have one person in the store, but in 2019, I used to have 10 people in the store and, and thinking through those things and, and going and trying to find the, um, the governmental order that is, that is restricting you. There's professionals out there that can help you with this kind of stuff. We're happy to help you with this kind of stuff, but these really are like the next steps. Um, once you figure out what the, you know, what quarters you may be eligible for, it's really just a matter of plugging and chugging the numbers. Um, and then overlaying that with what was going on with PPP, what was going on with FFCRA and, um, you know, figuring out what you may be eligible for based on, on that kind of stuff. So that's sort of the, the step-by-step if, if that's what you're looking for. It, it's a heavy lift but it is um, absolutely worth the, the dollars and cents that are coming out of this program. Because they, I mean, if you think about it, you're basically asking someone to pay forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. And you may be throttled back a little bit because of PPP forgiveness, or you know, maybe you already claimed some FFCRA, but it doesn't take too, too much to get to um, the max qualifications here. Having said that, being a heavy lift, I mean, this sounds like it's something that the business owner probably needs professional guidance to get through and do the filing. I mean, it's not something my life. X is a, is a bear. Um, it's not a okay. form that I would, I, like, I, I don't like it. Um, Peter and I, <laughs> the first one we had of these, it took us like an hour and a half just to like go through it <laughs> to like figure out the, and I was like together on the phone. I mean, it was a while ago, but it's a pain. Um, I think getting help. I mean, you, I'm sure people have tax professionals. With, um, you know, Norma and Heather or us. You know, we're happy to to work through this with people. Um, and that gives you all those other things that we talked about that can help. You know, in the future, which is, you know, your work papers and your worksheets and your government orders and show, tying it all together. So that way, you have like a nice package. And then frankly, you don't have to deal with it. Um, not everyone likes this kind of work, um, you know, which I can understand, but it's something that we do, you know, all the time. And, and you know, um, Heather and Norma as well. Yeah, and uh, for those that use a payroll service like ADP, they won't do a 941X, uh, would not be your best solution. So um, they may- They also have made so many mistakes calculating the credits, so yeah. many mistakes that we've had to fix. Yeah, so I um, I really would shy away from using them. Um, they they might do it, but I don't know if they're your best resource. So I agree with Rebecca. You might want to think about someone else outside of your 
payroll provider to do the 931X. And they will come out and, and say, we can do this for you. And they want, you know, they want to give it a try. But, you know, like we just said, there's a lot of mistakes going that way. And they don't necessarily understand the, you know, the accounting and the legal aspects of this to do it appropriately. And, you know, as Rebecca did note, you know, just keeping the work papers appropriately to where if it does come under audit in subsequent years yeah. that, you know, you've got everything documented appropriately. So um, that's where the, the third parties might come in and be a better benefit. I mean, we've seen it go both ways. ADP making mistakes where the credit's not enough and like then you're like come in as a hero and it's great. And then you see it the other way. And you're like, okay, well, they claimed too much. They didn't look at your PPP. Now you're in a jam. Um, and like, maybe they just didn't have you deposit. And so now you actually owe money and it, it, it can be a mess. So um, definitely, yeah, whatever the tax equivalent is, like a measure twice, cut once kind of a deal. All right, thank you so much. Let us know if there's anything we can do or if there's any other questions. Yeah, no, th thank you guys for taking the time and trying and putting that all together for us. Um, and as the slide says, stay in touch. Um, I would encourage you know, each of the, everybody on the line to take a look at what you've got in as, uh, you know, Peter said, or, you know, start looking at your, your numbers, break it out by quarter and see where you're, you are. And you may be in a good space with that, but definitely reach out to your accounting uh, professional to give you some more guidance on that. And if not, dial back to, uh, to, to Rebecca or Heather um, to kind of get a look at this because it could be money. It's not like you all said, it's, not, it's something different. It never happened, first time ever, obviously. And so the process is a little uh, uncertain, but uh, investing a little bit of time may have a nice ROI for you. So I encourage you to take a look. So having